We've had a, a small hiccup, but it's all going to work out. Alma was uh, trying to make a flight to cover Obama's visit to Cuba. She's on her way. She will be here shortly. Um, and the other hiccup that we've had that has actually turned into a beautiful thing is that Chris Bogner is ill, and so he's unable to be here with us. Um, however, we were able to recruit Mr. Will Evans, who you will not be able to read about in your program, but you will be reading about in newspapers and magazines everywhere as in the months to come. He is the founder of Deep Bellum Publishing, which is an independent translation house um, that is also on its way to opening a bookstore in Deep Bellum. So if you weren't here last night, we sort of wanted to uh, start with talking about Alma's uh, beautiful talk. She spoke about what a literary city is, what it should be, what it could be, um, and one of the, she hit three pretty specific points. And the first point that she hit was that a literary city is a walking city. And um, also pointed out that Dallas is not a walking city, and she was not going to be the person to solve that problem. But the, t the two actions, the two big ideas that she brought to the table were um, making libraries a more glamorous, open, neighborhood-centric place, um, as well as teaching nonfiction writing in high schools. Um, and she suggested there would, could be initiatives to team up professional journalists and writers with high school students and send them out into communities that aren't their own and have them begin to uh, work through the storytelling process of the communities that we are a part of. Um, so for you, those of you who were here last night, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on these two big ideas. Um, and we'll start from there. Merit, do you want to, do you have idea? Do you have, <laughs> jump in. Why did everyone look at me? <laughs> I don't know, you're the writer on the panel. You, you started at the top, my friend. Yeah. yeah. The talent. So I think, uh, my name's Merit Tierce, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a novelist, and, uh, and I lived in Dallas for about seven years. I live in Denton now, and I, I love the idea of a literary city being a walking city. I think it's a brilliant truth, um, and, uh, I was recently on book tour in Italy, and all of the bookstores that I did events at were very much local community institutions. They were very small places, but um, every, every place that I appeared at was uh, beloved in its own community, and of course it was, um, it, it was, they were all walking cities to an absurd degree for my Western mind. I mean, there were places that cars zipped into that my husband and I just thought cars would never, you know, tiny spaces, and a, and a car would just zoom past you into a little alcove. Um, but the city was designed for pedestrians, I mean, uh, and so there was no way you could help but walk past the local bookstores. And it blew my mind that there would be a bookstore on one block and on you know the next block another independent bookstore with its own kind of flavor and this is in a village where there's only 20,000 people it was just important and it was institutional and it was um, so much a part of the fabric of that community that um, that it would be you know designed like that so do you think that in your as the writer on this panel do you think that Dallas it, there's a disadvantage to you of the separation in the car? I mean, as you're, as you're experiencing the city and then cap and bringing it into your brain and thinking about how it affects you as a writer, do you think that there's a disadvantage? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, you're in a steel box surrounded by other boxes. You're not interacting with people. And um, people are fundamentally where stories come from and so that's fundamentally what the the origin of a literary culture is based in interactions among people, and and you don't have that in a, in a car in a car oriented city. Yeah, Daryl, you teach at SMU. Yes. Can you speak a little bit to the the bubble life there and to the advantages and disadvantages of as we, in the physical city they brought up this idea that campus is its own city. Um, but do you see that as an advantage or disadvantage with your students? Um, it can be a, a bit of a disadvantage. Um, for SMU in particular, 
Um, and we've heard this from many people in the community when they, they talk about, when they think about SMU, they think about a place that this is, it's not, even though there are no walls around it, they feel like there are walls in the sense that if we have a literary event on campus, which we do on a regular basis, okay, they're gonna have to come to campus. They're gonna have to find parking on campus. Where do you find parking on campus? I don't know, there's no visitor center where you can easily find parking. Then you have to find the building where you're supposed to go and then you have to find, you know, um, get in there. And unless you actually know somebody there who can give you directions or you know where you're going, it can feel like the, 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 these great literary events that we have on campus, that they're inaccessible, even though they're free and open to the public. So if you're not already part of a mailing list in a community, um, all this great literature that, that is being expressed, presented, performed, um, all these other performances on SMU's campus can feel like they're cut off from the community. So I mean, one thing that um, one of my colleagues, Greg Roundville, has suggested very recently um, is that why don't we think about, say, taking some of our readings into the community and actually having events you know, at a place where it's dark and there, there are drinks and, and people can actually talk to some of these really great lecturers, writers that we bring to campus. And um, there's really no, no restriction except that we want to keep things on campus. So it's, we can start thinking outside of that bubble. I mean, how can we actually reach out to the community, physically go out to the community and make SMU part of the community rather than having the community come into SMU? Yeah, and Will, your bookstore is gonna be street-facing in Deep LM, and it'll be similar in a lot of ways to the other independent uh, new bookstore in Oak Cliff, The Wild Detectives, which is very much part of its neighborhood. Is that something that you're conscious of as you're working towards opening the bookstore? Absolutely. Uh, I'd just like to say, please come and do your events in our bookstore in Deep Ellum. <laughs> this is how it happens. Um, you, you need a partner to get off campus, and uh, we set up this bookstore to be that kind of partner. To We want to be a Deep Ellum version of what uh, the Wild Detectives is to Oak Cliff and the Bishop Arts District. And so Deep Ellum is a quite different neighborhood. It's very urban. Uh, it's, uh, you know, very diverse. And I, I've always, I, I love it. I called my company Deep Vellum because I love the history of this neighborhood and what it represents in our city. Um, I think it's the melting pot neighborhood. It's where everyone in Dallas, regardless of class, race, gender, no matter where you come from, you come to Deep Vellum. And this is where you come together. It's one of the very few neighborhoods we have like that in the city or have ever had. Uh, it's historically been that neighborhood and that's why I set up the company there and so I've worked there for three years. Uh, it's why I won't really ever leave the neighborhood. But uh, in terms of getting more people to these communities, I think it's interesting that the first thing Merritt said about Walking City is to go to a bookstore. Because a bookstore is this place where event, it's, it, a bookstore is supposed to be a reflection of a community. And it's the same thing a library is supposed to be. So to harp on that library point too. Um, and they are complementary facets of what makes a really strong community. Um, a bookstore is not a library and shouldn't be, and a library shouldn't be a bookstore. But what they offer is really wonderful programming opportunities to different parts of the community because there's so many different layers of Dallas and what we do is very literary um, and then uh, it doesn't necessarily work with children but children obviously need tons of events and so our bookstore is not going to be that place but hopefully our local libraries can be hopefully someone out there will start a children's bookstore in Dallas or a bookstore in their own neighborhood because it's crazy we live in a city of you know a million and a half people and there's only two places to buy new books in the city that's just that's wrong uh, but I, I think that this leads to something I would always just say is that like partnerships are the most important thing that we can all do together. And we're, we're a whole lot stronger together. And this whole idea of a literary city only becomes real when we get together instead of just staying in our bubbles. Because you may be at SMU, but I'm in Deep Ellum, and that's its own bubble. And we all have our own bubbles that we have to confront to be successful and to truly make positive change in like what we all believe in. And Lisa, you work with literacy. Yes. Um, which in, in Dallas is a distinct challenge because the statistic is one in five people in Dallas cannot read. One in five people in Dallas cannot read at a functional level. And <clears throat> I think that affects all of us um, in ways that we sometimes don't think about. Um, but uh, just back to the walking city, I love it. Um, Dallas is my home. Is anybody else here from Dallas? No? Oh, are you? Okay. Well, I, well, I love Dallas, I and um, growing up here, I, I walked everywhere. Um, and now the only people I really see walking um, are, you know, would be the homeless population. They walk 
a lot. And um, so, you know, uh, one of my friends who works at SMU, as a matter of fact, said that uh, she was walking somewhere and um, she told somebody she was gonna walk from her home to SMU and they said, why, don't you have a car? I mean, why are you walking? So there's not really a culture of walking in Dallas um, and sometimes it seems to be a little bit odd when you see people just walking around, but, but I love it. I live in the North Oak Cliff area and um, I've been to Will's store and I've been to Wild Detectives, and Dallas has a very, very rich literary community. Um, but it, the, the truth is that there are pockets everywhere. And um, if we want, as Alma said last night, writers, writers need readers. Um, so, you know, we have this very rich cultural community here, but if people can't read it, whether it's in English, Spanish, or one of the other many languages represented in our community, then all of us are diminished. Yeah, she said something beautiful that, that, I, that made me think of you last night. She said, books want all the readers in the world. And then she continued, it's where they discover all the people they can be. And I thought that was a beautiful example of why it's important for people to learn how to read well and enjoy it. Exactly. I, I just wanted to say real quick that I, I had a really interesting time starting Deep Vellum in Dallas, and it's a literary arts organization. Uh, this is not a city that has a strong history of literary arts organizations. It seems like literary stuff falls under education here, which is a crucial component. But when I would tell people that we are a literary organization, they would say, oh, so you do literacy stuff. Mm. And, I, and I had, and you would have to step back and say, no, we're, we are not a literacy organization at all. And, but what we do is, is help we partner with literacy organizations because obviously it helps our publishing house if everyone can read. It is about building readers and it is about building a strong community. But that's why, uh, even though Deep Vellum is not a literacy organization, I, I volunteer my time with Lyft because it's something I obviously believe in like deeply. Thanks, Will. <laughs> Merritt, what are some tools that are missing in Dallas for writers? What are things that would encourage you to participate more in the city life? as a writer? Uh, sidewalks. I mean, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I keep thinking. When, if, you're, if you're going back to a walking city, there is, you can't have haphazard or missing sidewalks. That, like, that's essential. But also, I think what I was thinking of when Will was talking just now was that um, when you're trying to build a literary culture in a place that doesn't have a deep history of literary culture, part of your job is to educate people about what a literary culture is. And you know, to to take that opportunity of you know, even the word literary being so foreign that um, you have a chance to help people understand what the value of a literary culture is exactly. And um, to jump way back to Dr. Carr's uh, mention of <laughs> darkness, I I love that. There's nothing that kills like mystery and vibe faster than fluorescent lights like you have a, you know in a college setting or um, so I'm I'm all in favor of literary events that take place in more sexy if you will venues um, and that it means like you know dark places where alcohol is served <laughs> which I think has a lot to do with the wild detective success um, th they're phenomenal uh, literarians as well but I, Some random thoughts. You know, one, one thing that I encounter a lot whenever I tell people that I'm an English professor at SMU, they say, English was my worst subject, which is usually the first thing that comes out of their mouths, which is not the best way to start a conversation. But, it's, but, it's, uh, but, but, but what's behind the, that statement is that, that English is supposed, and literature is supposed to be this thing that is forbidding, it is impenetrable, it is not accessible, the people who write it are not accessible, that, that when they read, that they're, they're, probably, they're going to give a reading, it's going to be them reading in a monotone for about 15 minutes like this. And there's, and there's nothing that you're supposed to get out of it. They don't understand that, that this is inter, it's an interactive art, not just because you read it, but because you, you hear it, you feel it. And, and to, to, to re-educate people, you have to get them to understand that, this is a perf that reading is a performance. You know, reading uh, by yourself or reading out loud, this, these are, are, are people performing their, their poetry or, or their fiction 
this is this is a performance, and it is, and it's rich, and it's it's it's, it's, it's enjoyable, yeah. and that's what you get from from sexier venues. Is you get people actually interacting and feeling like they're part of an audience, as opposed to this this romantic idea, which is not very fun of just you being their cloister, unable to you know, and with, alone with the book and. That this is that this is not enjoyable. Reading is fun. It's, it's fun in, in multiple ways. But, but a lot of people, in, if there's a city without a literary culture and they cannot access it, they never get to see this. Especially if it's, if it's, it's, it's closed off to somebody under fluorescent lights in a, in a dull room, and, and they never get to see just how much fun we have working with literature. But also, if you can't read, it's not fun. I mean, uh, we left literacy instruction for Texas. Um, is the only place where people who never learn to read, um, no matter what their language, can come to learn to read. And what um, I've discovered is that when people do learn to read, wow, it opens up a whole new world for them. Um, you know, there was one guy who actually graduated from high school here in Dallas, reading at the second grade level, and uh, he owned a business, owned a limo business, which was not doing well because he couldn't keep up with the paperwork, obviously. But anyway, he um, came to Lyft and ended up really being able to read fairly well after being there several, um, several months. And, uh, and he was giving a speech and said that uh, he now loves poetry and he loves Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So everybody thought, wow, you know, that's interesting for somebody to go from not being able to read at all to really being able to read and comprehend poetry, and I love that. We're so glad you could make it. Uh, that's so Alma. <laughs> Welcome. So um, I'd love to, I think it will be perfect time to revisit your idea um, uh, and observations about the libraries in Columbia, if you could sort of revisit the, what that looks like. Yes, absolutely. Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry. I think I was supposed to be, people thought I was supposed to be someplace entirely different. But here I am. I'm very glad to see you all. And thank you all for being patient and going ahead. Um, so my whole point about libraries was um, that they should be a magnet, and they should be an almost glamorous center. So that reading is no longer chore-like, but something aspirational even. And uh, I was taking this off the idea of the grandes bibliotecas in Bogota and the one in Medellin. This was a very ambitious project by the mayor, Enrique Peñalosa, who was elected in 1998. And this was the beginning of a big turnaround for Bogota and for Colombia. This place where people were terrified of going, where nobody had any self-pride, where the only thing that you heard about Bogota was a bomb here and a bomb there. Pablo Escobar had been killed, the drug trade was dying down. There were enormous amounts of internal displacees, I guess is the term, uh, like 3.5 million people displaced by the internal many civil wars in Colombia or conflicts. Um, and these people had all arrived uh, the way that displaced people do in sort of the outer margins of the city. No services, no water, no light. Eventually, these things get put in. And the mayor said, let's have three architects do three of the most architecturally ambitious libraries we can imagine. And then let's link them to a system of parks. And then let's put bicycle paths from one to the other. Um, and I went and revisited them again last week. One is called El Tintal, the other one is called El Tunal, and the other one is called Virgilio Barco. The one that's called El Tintal is now officially the Gabriel Garcia Marquez Library. And the one that's called El Tunal is now officially, and I'm doing the senior thing, the name will come to me in a second, named after Colombia's most prominent um, black writer. And then the Virgilio Barco is just known as the Virgilio Barco because it was designed by Colombia's most prominent architect who has since died. 
What has happened at these three libraries? Um, one of them is very successful. One of them is in the middle of a public park, and it's more a place where tourists go to see Virgilio Barco's beautiful, beautiful building. One of them, El Pintal, now is in the middle of a hugely crowded area of town. It was, when I first went there, fields, just plain fields, and now it is almost invisible, this very beautiful building which was built from a reconverted um, trash recycling station. And a wonderful architect made this trash recycling station symbolically into this very beautiful library. When Susan Sontag went there, she said that what had most gotten to her about that whole idea of a library for displaced people in the middle still of this conflict, which may, if we're lucky, end next month. She said, you know, there were all these computer banks. I sort of expected that. And then there was a piano, a piano in this enormous lobby. And that was what brought me to tears. Um, because she said it was the idea that you can aspire to anything. It's not that you're brought up to social level. It's that it's all for you. And so part of this idea of the grand libraries is it's all for you. The best library, the best architect, the best computers, but also the best access to art, it's for you. Not for anybody else. You're getting first dibs at this. So I find this extraordinarily moving. What has happened to the actual programming? The Tintal is very successful. It's near um, above ground subway stop. And so there's very ready access for the 1,800,000 people who it's supposed to serve. It's the only library for nearly 2 million people in the whole surrounds. Um, and it's used, it gets used a lot. The other library, paradoxically, is near or in a real park. The kids come to the park to play, but they don't really go into the library. So it's not the library destination as a library. And the other thing that has happened, I think they've been careless with their programming. It's turned into a kind of typical library outreach program where women can go there and learn to knit or to make jello in jello molds or especially elderly people go and they do these very moving plastiline statues uh, or paintings of the Virgin Mary or, or John F. Kennedy or whatever. Um, but that's not really a, what this is about. And so I think another essential element is that if it's going to be a library and it's going to do outreach and it is going to be in a neighborhood that has been deprived of this wonderful privilege of books, then it really has to say books are where the fun is, books are where the glamour is. Uh, I just love that story. And the, and the Medellin Library that's on the mountaintop. Exactly. With the, with the tramway that goes up to it. Yes. It's just like, it's just so inspiring. Uh, I, I wanted to say like really quickly that I love the way you ended with the idea that books should be the focus of a library because in our state there was a, the first bookless library opened in San Antonio, and uh, which huh. is uh, really interesting for a huh. lot of people because some people see now that libraries' roles have changed to be these bastions of information, um, which is quite different than what libraries are supposed to do and what I really believe that they're supposed to do and that's be bastions of knowledge. And information is only one tiny piece of knowledge and books are kind of what take you to the next level. Just like literacy is where you begin, literary is what comes next. And it is a graduated scale. And when I first, uh, before I ever even moved to Dallas, I was here for a summer, and I stayed in Victory Park. Has anyone ever been to Victory Park? Um, it was uh, so alienating. Um, and so the, the second day I was in Dallas, my, my wife went to her job that we were here for, and uh, we didn't have, she took the car, and we only had one car. So I said, I'm gonna give myself a walking tour of downtown Dallas. And I, my goal was to hit certain major points. I wanted to go to the old Red Museum to learn why Dallas exists, which I found out. 
and I wanted to, and I wanted to go to the public library because it was this beautifully designed building and it has this amazing collection and uh, you know I love libraries and then I was going to walk back via the Neiman Marcus so I could see it and all that fun stuff and so I told someone that in the building as I was walking out and they're like are you insane like what? I was like no it's only like a three mile loop you know it's like not it's not far and they're like yeah man but it's like 110 outside and there's no sidewalks and you're gonna get hit by a car or three or ten and to, to or be, people will just think you're homeless. <laughs> so all of those things happened on this walk, like literally all of them. I almost melted. I was almost hit by 10 cars, and people were just yelling out of their cars like they were walking. And I was the only pedestrian I saw the entire walk. But I, I, I just want to say I got to the library, right, which is like this place. It is a very interesting building. And uh, I know some people don't like that era of architecture. I find it fascinating. And I think that the building is really interestingly designed. But more than that, you have like this place that is a mixture of just bastion of knowledge, interesting architecture. And it's like, it should be the heart of downtown with City Hall right there in this beautiful plaza. And in this library, we have these decks that are stacked. It's kind of like this like, like opposite, it's like a wedding cake, I guess, like almost with these balconies that face out in City Hall. And uh, for some reason, like, I don't know very many people who've ever been to this library and, and among my peer group, I guess you could say. And it's just tragic because it's like really a wonderful place that, yeah, absolutely, with some programming, the downtown public library and every library in Dallas can become just more. I'm not saying it's not awesome already, I'm just saying it can be more awesome. And, and more so like, yeah. yeah, and so it's like, a, I, I find this super important part of like what all of our, what kind of what connects us, because it's, it's, you know, it's the same thing with SMU's libraries. And I don't know if anyone knows this, but if you have a public library card, you can get a library card to check out books at SMU, the text share program, which I think is a wonderful resource. And so you have like this information sharing, we're all part of the same community, there shouldn't be these divides, these walls. Manuel Zapata Oliveira, I'm sorry, that's the name of the Afro <laughs> 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 but like the, the, the story I was telling you earlier, or when we, the question Lauren asked earlier about, you know, the, the difficulty of, of this kind of access. I mean, I had kind of a similar story the first time I went to the downtown library because I couldn't find the book at SMU, so I said, I'm going to go get it down there. And I, I think by the time I got in and out of the library, I think I had probably, you know, knocked 10 years off my life because of trying to find, you know, my way downtown. I was new to Dallas and then trying to find parking and then trying to to get in there and then get out, you know, without any, and, and so it, it, it became more of a hassle, and that's part of Dallas's design, but there, you can change the design of the city. You can, you can, you know, redo the sidewalks. You can redo the way uh, um, the curbs are made, simply to make a city more walkable and make it friendlier, and also to just open up access, transportation access to these kinds of sites. Um, and and that, that's what helped. I mean, like the plaza where, where City Hall and the library is, there's also, of course, right next to it is, a, is an old abandoned building that is... How is long has that building been abandoned? Like, it, a forever. long time. So, I mean, and the city's working on it, but it takes a long time to work on it. So this is about our will as a city to really to transform these spaces so that people want to go down there. That it, it's not just half of the plaza is, is beautiful. All of it is beautiful. And, and, and it's, it, it really is a city center. I'm curious, Lisa, because I think a lot of what we're talking about is accessibility and, um, and, and sort of neighborhood-driven approach, but I'm curious, I want to talk a little bit about motivation, and I'm curious for you at your organization, what motivates someone to, learn, to say, I, I'm going to learn how to read? Oh, well, uh, generally speaking, it's a life event because most people, well, first of all, illiteracy is, um, uh, the, the, um, es it's estimated that by 2030, unless something, unless we as a community come together to address this problem, we will have close to a million people in the city of Dallas that can't read at all. Um, so uh, we have to address this problem, you know, rather systemically, and it's also intergenerational. So. Generally speaking, if a parent can't read, they can't help the child with the homework, they are afraid to go to the school, so it, you know, there are a lot of implications about it. But generally, an adult who cannot read has developed a number of coping skills, a great memory, uh, they can get people to do things for them, they have people that they can rely on, 
When that person goes away, that enabler goes away, then this person says, you know, I must learn to read. Um, and th so the people that come to Lyft, in my opinion, and we have right now about 3,000 people in our program um, in 14 sites around the city, but they are highly motivated. And I, the, the native English speakers are so adept at not letting anybody know that they have this uh, difference that uh, a lot of times family members don't really know that a person is completely illiterate. And I'm talking about people who can't identify a letter, a letter sound, um, you know, uh, and just don't know anything about how to read. So think about the stress that that causes a person and the stress in that person's life and that person's family. So when they finally find out that uh, that Lyft exists, and we've been around for 55 years, and a lot of people don't really know about us, but when they do come to us, uh, they're highly motivated. It takes a lot of work for a person to start from scratch, basically, to learn to read. And uh, Alma, I'm in my Spanish class. We offer Spanish classes, too. So I, I'm, I'm very aware that we live in a bilingual city. Um, in fact, we live in a multilingual city. And so if a person doesn't know how to speak Spanish and read Spanish in Dallas and in Texas, then that person is at a disadvantage, too. Or, or Arabic, the taxi driver who took me here or failed to take me here. <laughs> you want to see it. Um, suddenly, at gate 8 or gate 17 or gate something or other, saw somebody and started speaking to them in Arabic. And apparently, there's just an enormous Arab community. And instant friends, of course. So, you know, there was, yes, tell her to get out of the taxi and run. One of the other really important questions that we've sort of been challenged to address today is well, how do we start to tell our story as a city? Um, what does that look like? What does it look like when a city sort of takes that responsibility on? And you had the, one of the other ideas you presented last night was to bring high, teen high schoolers up with uh, nonfiction writers. Could you talk a little bit about that idea? Thank you for remembering that. I really <coughs> like that idea. I do too. Um, Let's see, how do I start this? Ages ago, I taught at a school called back then Harlem Prep, it's gone now. Um, but it was supposed to take mostly young men, mostly just out of jail, and prepare them for college intensively. Um, it, it mixed to not so good results. But the point of this is that at one point, I decided that we should all go to the Natural History Museum because I discovered that they had never been to a museum before. And what I remember so sharply from that experience, first that I thought, I'm definitely going to be put in jail because we got to the subway station and they all leapt over the turns. I was like, this is how you get into a subway, right? You just go home. Um, but the second thing is that Going into that museum for them was probably about 10 times more intimidating than walking into prison. It was a completely terrifying experience um, because they felt they had no place there. And so the idea of taking young people and making the opposite city available to them seems to me, unlike the library system, quite easy to do, in fact, if you make young people report. And I know this from experience. I'm so much more confident and confident when I've got a notebook between me and the world. So that if you're actually a 17-year-old from a suburban, ritzy high school going to report on a part of Dallas that you've never seen, and you have a task you have a, something to accomplish while you're there, and your task is to observe and to ask questions and then to make a story about that part of the world that you've never been before, I think that you really can leap from my own experience as a reporter 
you can leap into that other world much more immediately. And the same goes for, say, Latino kids. In, I don't know Dallas, but there must be large communities here, right? It's about 42%, I believe, is, is Latino. Yeah. For example, yeah. Uh, who can have that same experience and be empowered to have that experience. And at the same time, understand that the word is a way to understanding and that shaping a sentence is shaping your mind. Um, and I think that's easy to do, and to do it with mentors who would come from the newspapers around town. One, one thing to think about is that Dallas has a diaspora of, of, of thinkers and writers who have, who, who either they're still here or they've left here, they might have come back, and they're from different parts of the city. So what if a call went out to people who are from Dallas to either, they don't have to necessarily come back to Dallas if they don't live here anymore, but what if you put a call out for stories about Dallas's neighborhoods? What if you ask writers, famous writers who are from Dallas, you know, and who might actually still be writing about Dallas, you know, would you be willing to write a piece about your neighborhood? Um, start collecting stories about Dallas, create um, and, and this is an oral history of Dallas, or even or a, in a written history of Dallas. That, but, but use the people, the great talent that has come out of the city to write about it. Um, and, and the talent that's still here, there's still a lot of great writers who, who live here in Dallas, but they might not necessarily write about Dallas. Get them to look you know, more in to, the, to this world and, and in a way expose Dallas's richness to the rest of the world. So I mean, that's something that, that could, there, if you had people who could organize that, or if you had, for example, a, a panel, a conference, a, a festival like this, where you had Dallas's great writers or uh, come back here and, uh, to represent the stories, you might get a lot of interest in that. You could, and you could have something permanent to hold on to. This would be a natural bridge for me to talk about how valuable publishers are. <laughs> uh, because we broadcast stories to the world. That's what a publisher does, is takes a story and then makes it available to readers. There's a commercial element to that, but a Deep Vellum is much better known in New York and London and Frankfurt, Germany and Moscow, Russia than it is in Dallas. Uh, although I work every day and the media has been wonderful here, it still only reaches a percentage of the city. Um, but in terms of the literary communities that do exist elsewhere, um, publishers are the way to bridge these gaps, right? To make Dallas known as a literary city, we have to have writers from here, and we have to have publishers from here, and we have to have amazing literary organizations that do great events. Um, but rather than talk about publishing anymore, I just want to say that this idea is fantastic, and I do want to give a shout out to the one organization that really does this extremely well in the city right now, probably the coolest literary thing that exists in Dallas, Diverse Lounge. And they're a part of this festival. Like, they are, uh, they are the coolest. Um, so uh, they're, Diverse Lounge. There's a guy named Will Ritchie, yeah. who is a, a accomplished, award-winning performance poet, and he goes into schools predominantly in South Dallas. So even though Dallas is a is a racially mixed city, the school district, the, the public schools, are uh, entirely Latino and African American. It is 98 percent, I think, um, and so it's there's a huge economic and disadvantage issue going on here. But he goes into these schools and he takes kids that are like no hope, no future, no whatever. And he just teaches them to write and to tell their story Thank via poetry, and then they perform it. And they perform it at Life in Deep Ellum, which is, you could walk to from here, I, but if anyone has ever walked there, I would be shocked. <laughs> but you can, it's like not even a mile from here. And uh, it's just, it's like two blocks from our bookstore. Life in Deep Ellum's a wonderful community center, but they host Diverse Lounge, and hundreds of kids from all the schools across the city come in. They get bussed in, and they perform. And if you get a chance after this, go into the Women's Museum, because there's a huge banner in there that says one of us is a word, but like together we are a message. And that is by a product of Diverse Lounge, uh, a guy named Topic, who is a, a mm -hmm. he used this, this voice that he discovered through Diverse Lounge to become a hip hop artist. He is, he's working with some of the most accomplished hip hop artists in the, in the country. Uh, and he's really making a name for Dallas in this way, but he's the most, one of the most literary people in this city, but he's not part of the literary community per se. I think he is, but not everybody knows him. And so I think it's kind of cool to be able to say Diverse Lounge has had extreme success and there are statistics behind it and that it's a natural bridge to open it up also to nonfiction and then also to fiction. Perfect. Let's merit, I want to throw it to you and pull you back in for your book 
is about Dallas. Love Me Back takes place in Dallas. Can you talk a little bit about what made you choose to write about this city instead of another city? Uh, well, I think that it felt like um, territory that hadn't already been claimed completely to me, but also I just feel like on its own, it's, it's rich in um, appalling class stratification and um, that just made for really great drama, um, which is all an assessment I'm making after the fact. I just wrote the book you know, from deep personal experiences within that um, world. My book is set in a fine dining Dallas steakhouse in, uh, in Uptown, and that's a world that I was very familiar with, and, um, and it's, it's such a perfect um, cross-section of, uh, you know, you have um, undocumented and um, quite possibly illiterate, uh, non-native English-speaking cooks, and then you have billionaires, you know, eating the food and running the place, and, and everything in between. As, um, so the, the book is a lot about work and money, um, and I think that Dallas is, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of Dallas's soul is about work and money. Um, but the reason my book succeeds as a, as a novel, if it does, is that within that are people striving and struggling and um, coming to work every day in the middle of whatever their own story is. And uh, that's, I think, all that I ever want from a book is some celebration or at least some acknowledgement that every single story is, you know, that, that every life is being lived by an individual, a human, with a, you know, a beginning and an end. Um, and maybe they don't know how to narrate their own middle, but if, if you can say that it's worth narrating, that's the whole point of all of it, I think. And, and I really like what Alma is saying about sending um, teenagers, especially, into places where they may feel like they don't have, they can't grant themselves the authority to be there um, because they may not feel like they belong but you give them a mission or you know the idea that um, telling a story finding a story is something anyone and everyone has the authority to do and you you break that down and then suddenly they can go anywhere yeah that's the idea Lisa, i'm curious if you can speak to like if you from your experience, think that this idea of getting someone excited about a story would help contribute to encouraging them to learn how to read? Or Yes, so thank you for bringing that up because Lyft is in a collaboration with SMU Meadows School of the Arts. As a matter of fact, Clyde Valentin, who is part of this, um, and the Dallas Theater Center will be bringing um, public works as part of our um, offering to some of our adults. So this will give them an opportunity not to tell, so it'll be part movement, because we know that a lot of people who um, are low literate have, some people have diabetes, hypertension, they don't know it because they can't read about it, they know they're not feeling well. So, you know, we're gonna have this movement, um, so portion of it, and also a storytelling, not their own story, but just the ability to tell a story. And uh, we're really very excited about that. It's a year-long project, um, and we will have an artist in residence with us that will come you know, every week to work with our adults on that. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and also, you know, collaboration is just um, such an amazing, uh, transformative, opportunity for all of us. Will brought uh, the Duke Alumni Association. They volunteered with us on a number of occasions. And so this brings an intersection of people like some of the people you were talking about 
in contact with people that they would never know in this city. And so many of those uh, Duke folks are now volunteers with us. They're employment coaches. They talk to people about how they can have a better life. So I think, you know, our job is to uh, have more of those opportunities for people who would never have the opportunity to engage with one another, to get to know each other as human beings. And, uh, you know, without a category or a label, but just as another human being, and the stories are very interesting. Daryl, do you think that something, an idea like this would work with SMU students as well? I, um, when I taught journalism at SMU, I know one of the biggest challenges is getting them getting the students themselves, even the journalism students, off campus, Absolutely. out of Highland Park University Park and just into the city. Um, and I'm curious if you think that it would even work on a college student level. I think it would. It, it, it takes the right leadership to, to, I think, inspire that. I think about one of my, my uh, friends and colleagues, Maria Dixon, who's a professor of communication at SMU, who's been very successful in, in getting students to start thinking about the world outside of SMU, or think about the world, period, and, and, and how they can contribute. And she's, she's essentially almost driven students out into the world so that they try to find ways that they can connect to the community. But I mean, she teaches corporate communications, and, and, and that's, of course, what she's trained to do. But it's about more than, say, communicating for corporations. It's about how do you actually get people interested in a project, interested in, a, in an initiative? How do you communicate it? How do you organize it in a way that it sells people and makes, them, makes people want to connect to your organization and to your ideas? And that takes a great deal of skill, but it's something that, that can be learned fairly quickly, and, but it takes practice and you have to get out to the community. And so she's very good at, at, at getting students to do that. But you need to have people who are, again, they're talking to each other, they're collaborating, they're, they're partnering with other, people, other organizations, and they're using their talents to get people who normally would not be involved in these efforts to play some role. You know, if somebody has a particular skill, get that person to join your organization and, and, and develop that particular skill and connect with a certain community that you want to connect with. Um, so it's possible to get SMU students to do it, and there are a lot of SMU students who are interested in these kinds of efforts. There, we have you know, the human rights program at SMU that has a lot of students who are deeply, deeply passionate about you know, these kinds of issues, because literacy is a human rights issue. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, it's the ability to, to be educated, to be able to read. These are things that all, everybody should be able to do. And, and you are economically, you know, you're, you're, you're stressed, you're distressed if you don't have access to information through your own, through your own literacy. So th there's, there are ways to connect that kind of program into these kinds of efforts. So, um, and the students who are part of that program to these efforts. So if we think creatively, there are ways to get SMU students involved. So I just have to tell you that the other really, really exciting thing is that uh, Dean David Chard, who is um, the Dean of the School of Education and Human Development at SMU, and uh, a colleague of his at the Guild Hall, which is the gaming uh, division of SMU, have, are collaborating with Lyft to develop a mobile app to teach people teach low literate people. Not, this is not for people who are at a high level. This is actually at the very lowest level to teach them how to read. And this app will be submitted for the X Prize in Adult Literacy, which is a $7 million prize that the Barbara Bush Literacy Foundation and Dollar General have put up. So we're very excited about it. And it, so there's so much exciting stuff going on in Dallas. Um, in 2019, Lauren, I think I told you, BoucherCon, which is the uh, Mystery Readers and Writers Conference, will bring over 2,000 people from around the country and the world here to Dallas. Dallas is, um, is, is home to the creative class, and I think that is by design. I think, you know, the city leaders and the business leaders at some point said, you know, what can we do to diversify the economy here, but also make it so that people who are um, business and, and corporate leaders want to come to this community. And in order to do that, uh, they had to invest in, in the, 
the things that the corporate, the creative class really wanted to engage in. So the, our challenge is to bridge those gaps because uh, as, as somebody said, Dallas has one of the highest concentrations of poverty in the United States. How can that be? I don't get that. But uh, part of it is that 360 people per day are moving into our community. 233 of those, it's estimated, are from other countries. So we have to figure out a way to make this economy more diverse for more people. Yeah. So in a minute, we're going to open it up to questions. So if anyone want, has a question, you can head to the microphones now. But I want to sort of bring this all together before we do that. In the Dallas is a strange, strange place. Um, <laughs> and part of why I think that that's true is that a lot of the narrative that reaches outside of Dallas about Dallas is Real Housewives, uh, reality television that is less than attractive for uh, people who are interested in engaging with a literary city. Uh, and I love the idea of actually putting, putting the burden of the story onto um, younger people and sending them into places they're not used to. But I'm curious, Alma, if you think that that needs to have uh, a specific output. Does it, need to, does it need to be printed in a newspaper? Do they have to see those stories to fruition? Um, if, if I can answer that question in just yes. one moment and go back to the idea of the library where the people are only because if you want to get people, literacy and actual reading books are two very different things and one is not necessarily a stage of the other. But in order to get people to the library in Bogotá, and I'm sure it's similar here, people leave their homes at five o'clock in the morning to go to a job at seven in the morning. And they leave their job at six in the afternoon to get back home at eight. And then the women start cooking and preparing the kids for school the next day. So to ask those communities to go to a library that's downtown is kind of unrealistic. It's rough. Um, so that's just one point about the libraries. And the thing about um, taking, making kids into reporters is that Garcia Marquez once said, um, the literary prize was being set up for the workshop center called the Foundation for New Journalism. He said, let's have a prize because it's not enough to be the best that has to become known. So this is a, a sentence from an endlessly ambitious man, right? In, in the best possible way that Garcia Marquez was. He had to make sure that he was going to be the best and that it was going to become known. So when you think about making kids into reporters, there's two parts. One is for the benefit of all the participating students, and the other is to find talent. And if you're looking for talent, then you have to then you have to either award a prize or publish it or select something to be published, but there has to be a reward involved. Do you, do you want to ask the first question? And as well, oh, there we go. Um, I heard a story the other day, and I honestly don't remember which program it was on, but it was about the archives at the New York Times and that they were going through all of the photographs that they've taken over years and years. Many of them do not have any kinds of captions or information, perhaps a date, and they're trying to determine where, who were these people that are in these photographs and why are they in these photographs. As we know, a lot of people's history is not what's brought to the newspapers. So, especially as we go further back in time, so they have kind of gone on this, um, well, an expedition looking for information about these photographs so they can tell a bigger story about their city. But I was thinking as you were speaking about Dallas's city, if that might be something that would be feasible to be able to go back into the archives of our local newspapers and look at some of those photographs, ask students, whether it be college students or 
uh, public school, private school students, to be given a photograph. Perhaps it's a neighborhood that is very familiar to them and motivates them to want to write about it. Or perhaps it's a neighborhood that's not, and they go out and find the story behind that photograph. A as an educator, I, I taught for 20 years and then went into administration. and. I definitely see the connection between reading and writing and how important that is. The trouble that I'm having now, and this is where my question is for the panel, um, I'm seeing every year our library budget decreases, and because school districts want to be on the cutting edge, our technology budget increases. And when I go and I try to make that argument for books, I am faced with, well, why? You can get all these books on a Nook. You can get them on your phone. You can get them on your iPad. And there's not, I guess because it's relatively new technology, or there's not a whole lot of research and data to show why it is important for a child. I know as a mom and as a teacher how, how much a child loves to have a book to hold on to. But I can't find the words to articulate what, or the data to show why that's important in our schools. And that's continuing on, on that trend, less books, more technology. So uh, do you have resources or a, sort of a direction you could point me in that would help me um, give them something concrete to show this is why we can't stop having books available to our kids? I uh, know some of these statistics, if you want Go me to share it, real well. quick. Um, I'm obsessed with books. Uh, I also don't mind ebooks, but uh, early research shows that ebooks are filed into anything you read on a screen, digital screen, like these words, goes to a different part of your brain than when you read something on the printed page. And uh, it's, this research is still early. It could change, but um, it, it shows that uh, books we like to think of as old fashioned. How many people thought of books as old fashioned? Probably a lot. It's what the media has been telling us for a long time. The fact of the matter is, they're not. They are a piece of technology that is perfected and has been constantly perfected over time for thousands of years. The way that words line up across the page in certain like lengths is good for the eyes, it's good for the brain, it goes into a certain part of your brain that you're able to recall, you're able to develop some empathy for these things, these sets of characters that make words, all the things that literacy teaches you how to read, and then when you learn how to read, you learn how to read what it means. And, uh, Ebooks don't do that at all. Like, not they are just a set of characters on a screen, and that is not surprising for anyone, probably in this room. Um, but the, that is what the data shows, and uh, some really amazing research on uh, reading and books and this kind of stuff is coming out of the National Endowment for the Arts. So, if, if you uh, would like to reach out to me after the panel, I can send you some of this information. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts supports literature as a part of the arts in our country, and so they do a lot of research about who reads, why do we read. Um, what can we do to get more people reading? So uh, we could talk more about that as a panel, or we could ask them. And I would also add that, um, you can applaud that, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I would also add that if you are at all interested in getting involved with the action portion of the festival afterwards, there's tables in the lobby to sign up, because I think that your, your idea about combining history with the storytelling is really important. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Ray Sablak, and I'm actually the manager of the North Oak Cliff Branch Library. So I've been very familiar. <laughs> I've checked out books from your library. My and, and I have an answer for her question, if, if you don't mind yeah. taking a moment. Um, School Library Journal actually just published an article about this last month. So um, there actually was a survey done for teenagers, and teenagers actually prefer books over e books. So um, we, have, we have statistics for that if you contact any of your Dallas Public Libraries, or if you'd like to contact me, I'd be more than happy to get that article out to you. <laughs> um, th this really wasn't a question, it was just kind of a reminder to everybody that for the first time we're having an expanded and much more expansive Dallas Book Festival next month. So this is going directly off of being a literary city. Um, April 30th, it will be encompassing all of downtown. We'll be reaching from the Dallas Public Library, the main library, across City Hall, and the street will be shut down. So it will be an entire literary festival, book festival, in the middle of downtown Dallas. So please everybody come. Uh, what, one cool thing too is our author uh, from Chile is gonna be on it too, which yes. is really exciting. So we're super excited to be partnering together this like first time to expand a festival. 
And, and I, again, just as a public librarian, I want to thank all of you for everything that you've done. Uh, you make our lives very, very much easier with your partnerships and, and your ideas. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, I was uh, recently told by the Urban Design Panel uh, that this idea of uh, building a, a big, beautiful library uh, is, uh, could be effective and, and uh, could be done in their point of view if the, uh, the design um, respected and reflected the, the tastes and, and habits of the people around the library and if, uh, if you wanted it really to be big and beautiful and magnificent if the philanthropic community stepped up because it would not be public funds or something like that. Um, but, so I was going to ask, how do we rally the philanthropic community to do that? Uh, but after hearing the panelists, I, I also wanted to ask, um, uh, how do we uh, influence these urban de design folks to, uh, to prioritize areas around libraries uh, to make them more walkable and more pleasant uh, and connected? We, well, I think the, uh, I don't know if you've been to the Hampton uh, library. I think it's really magnificent. It has a, a black box in there and it's just really, really a, a great space for, so I think some good things are happening with the libraries, but inspiring the philanthropic community to invest in libraries is not easy. Um, I know, uh, I won't mention any names, but I know that the University Park uh, public library system wanted to, you know, raise some money, and that's a very wealthy community, and they had a hard time getting people to really, you know, get behind the library and raising that money. So I, I think it's part of the spirit of the community. I think we all have to, how many people here have a library card? Oh, that's, that's a lot. Um, I just, uh, found out that about 650,000 people in our community have library cards, and I think that's pretty good. Um, so I think the more, you know, all of us need to have a library card, everybody needs to have a card and use the library system, and then I think there will be more investment in the libraries. I, I just want to say real quick about urban design stuff. I think it's kind of nice that there's a group in Dallas called the BC Workshop, Building Communities Workshop, and uh, they're kind of like a private partner, private public partnership, and their offices are right across the street from the public library, like on that really cool strip of one-story buildings. I think that that type of symbolic gesture is actually more meaningful than we think it is, but how many people know of that? And that's the kind of thing that we need to do and draw more attention to, and you know, things like events and public events, and I don't know, BC Workshop hosting some of these events with the library. I don't know or us or anyone, it could be the way that we connect that dot. And I would add to, um, as the journalist on the, well, one of the journalists on the panel, I think a lot of the, what Alma's idea about actually starting to tell the better, a different story of da about Dallas would help with that as well, and maybe a different story about the library. Uh, when I've covered the Dallas libraries in the past, it's amazing how, because no one goes to the library, they don't understand how valuable they are to the community that does show up. Um, so I think that changing the narrative is, would be helpful. I also think that the whole idea behind making a hugely architecturally ambitious project as opposed to a more realistic project makes it easier to fundraise for. Because then it's a flagship thing. I, I do want to just caution that something Dallas loves to do is to tear down buildings when they don't necessarily have to, and that the reason we have the public library that we're talking about tearing down right now is because they tore down the last two libraries that we have, and you can watch them gut the last public library right next to the Statler Hilton on Commerce Street, and that building had some really amazing art in it, and it was a really interesting space, and it's gone. And before that, there was a beautiful old grand library akin to the New York Public Library, and they tore the hell out. I mean, they just tore down so fast, and that was funded by Carnegie. And so that was the guy who funded pub basically public libraries to be built in Dallas, Fort Worth, all over the country. And so uh, I agree visionary libraries are uh, important, but I don't necessarily think we have to tear down what we have. I think that maybe we could build a new one or just continue Where there to is no other library. Yeah, yeah. and I, I liked what you said last night, Alma, too, about the building a library in a community that people don't go to if there isn't bad news. 
and making it so impossibly beautiful that you have to go to see it. Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Alinka Green, and I'm a community organizer. And a um, couple of things. Um, where I live at, we had the little free library to come in and work in the community at our community garden. I thought that was really, really cool to come in and do that. The, um, the second thing is that when I was coming up, we used to have the library mobile come in and come to the community with the books. I don't see that a whole lot. And that needs to be reinstituted because like she was saying, in Bogota, a lot of people can't get to the library. I live in a community where a lot of people don't have cars, okay? And I'm right down the street from the Paula Lawrence Stonebar Library, which a lot of people go to. But it would really be cool if that could be implemented back in to have that library to come back into their community, maybe like a central location, maybe like at a church or something, to have people to be able to come in and get those books or those videos or those DVDs. And the other thing is, is that um, with the money being spent, I would really advocate that the Martin Luther King Library in South Dallas be redesigned or given an updated look because that library is very, very important. Y'all give it up for that library, seriously, okay? But it has one of the largest collections of African American uh, books and stuff, but it needs to be, re you know, it needs to have an update. I don't know, Martha Stewart or whatever you want to call it. It needs new wallpaper, or whatever, because when I walk in, I feel like I'm walking in the 1970s. It needs to be updated, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people come there and use that. So I advocate for that. Uh, the Paul Lawrence Stormbar Library is very active in my community, but I'd like to see more of the libraries get out and do stuff, because like I did um, the Marshall Major Taylor bike ride. It's the first bicycle ride. We had the Iron Bicycle Riders ride all the way from Arlington, Texas to the Paul Lawrence Stormbar Library to celebrate Major Marshall Taylor, who was the first African-American bicyclist and they did a tour of the library. And they were like, we didn't know that's here. So that would be really cool if we could have more of those libraries get involved with communities, you know, reach out and find out how we can have community fairs and even for them to come because I engaged the Dallas Public Library downtown and they, they, they were really, really engaging about it. They came out, they set up books, they gave out library cards, but it's really a must that the community feel like you know, have that, have that connection, have that bridge. So I'm really advocating for that and for that, um, that library mobile to come back in the communities. I mean, like the central lo location at the church where there's children, because a lot of people can't walk. If it's 103 degrees in Dallas and the library is way up the street and you ain't got no car and you ain't got no bus pass, how do you get to the library? or even to bring a pseudo library into some of the churches. They have space. Imagine if you brought a Dallas Public Library into a church. Imagine how many people would get registered to get a library card, to be able to read, to have books about Jesus or different things like that. That is an idea. You bring, you bring that to the community. So I just want to advocate for that and say thank you guys for doing this, and it's really, really important. I've been all over the country, and then wherever I go, I always try to find libraries. And I know in Baltimore, they had the free library, which offered a lot of sanctuary to a lot of the children during the, uh, during the riots. So it's a safe place for people. It's a safe haven for a lot of folks. So we need to get back in that engagement, because as you know, black people weren't allowed to go to that library downtown many years ago. You know, that is a part of Dallas history you know, as far as being able to go get a book. So people set up, you know, lovers. And me, I just sold over $300 worth of my books. I have, and I still have books. I have like eight boxes, but for the past three months, I have been selling books. You know what I'm saying? Books that I've collected over the years. So I'm a mini bookseller. A lot of books that I don't want, I just set a table outside. I got a sign that say, please come by and get. But because, the library gave me, I want to give back. So just think about some of those ideas of setting up maybe like a library in some of the churches or some of the community centers. And y'all, all the books that y'all don't want, send them over there. So I have, I have good news to at least part of that, and then I'll let you speak to it. Um, one of the ideas that came out of last year's festival 
uh, and I'm not sure at, at, to what extent it will do everything that you're talking about, was a mobile cultural unit right. that could travel into different parts of the cities that don't necessarily have access to right. the arts or uh, books. And so I think that, um, that will, I think books will definitely be part of that. So right, right. That's at least one good thing I can say to that. And then Alma, did you want to? I, I just can't resist telling another story about Columbia. But I think the idea of putting libraries in churches or near churches is just fabulous. Because Ooh, give it up to me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What did I do? But I wanted uh, to mention the Burroteca in Colombia. How many of you have heard about the Burroteca? A man with a donkey with side saddles with the books, and he goes through the villages, the mountain villages, where there are really no roads, and distributes books. And there are variations of that all across the country. Where I live, a man comes once a week with a megaphone, and he asks for old books that we no longer want. And then he takes a motorbike and takes those into the villages and sells those books for 50 cents. So there is a market and there is a hunger always for books. And I would encourage you also to, to sign up to be part of the action committee and bring those ideas. Yeah. One, one last thought. I mean. So just talk about libraries. I mean, my, my sister is actually a children's librarian, and, and one thing that occurs to me after lots of conversations about her experiences, ask the librarians what their dream library looks like, and, and get them in on the planning for, for this, this kind of space. You know, talk about, about, about access, about what kind of, of, of offerings they want in the library, and, and work with the community, but certainly, but, but get the librarians in the conversation as well, because they're the, they're the caretakers of, of these wonderful objects. I think we probably have time for at least one more question. Sure. This is I'm Neil Foote at UNT's Mayborn School of Journalism, home of the Mayborn Literary Nonfiction Conference that Alma spoke at several years ago. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity and all great things that are going here on here in Dallas. One kind of point of uh, information, uh, several years ago here at the Mayborn School and even at uh, SMU, my colleague Jake Batson, we actually took out students and encouraged them to go into all parts of Oak Cliff and South Dallas and tell stories from those communities that one, we either ended up running in our own publications, but there was actually a website, dallassouthnews.org, that unfortunately, you know, kind of has gone by the wayside because of lack of funding to tell those stories. But I think there are opportunities to do that, to tell, to bring old school and new school technologies together. Uh, my question is, which I think this is the kind of fundamental question, is how do we make reading sexy again? How do we make reading sexy again? How do we make reading sexy? That's what it's still yeah. Take your clothes off and read, man. Like <laughs> invite people over, man. Like it's not hard. Just do sexy right. stuff when you read. Read Very sexy books, books. not if, if we want our young like, folks do sexy get stuff. back in the library. It's not rocket science. Just do it. Right. No, <laughs> do it in public. I'm dead serious. Read in public. Take a book with you everywhere you go. Like go to bars and read, man. Invite people over for book clubs. Like just it's 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 not it's not rocket science. Books have always been sexy. If you they can stare impressed. at your phone when you walk down the street, you can read when you walk Amen. down the street. I totally got it. Right. So how do we translate to our young folks that that's okay to do? That whatever you do, however you read it, hopefully in print, in digital, how do we make sure that's a cool thing to do? Because that's part of the barrier we've got to get over to get them in the library or even pick up a book or download a book or read something. So that, that's my point. Reading digitally is never going to be sexy, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, I think that you're not the only person with that question. Yeah. Um, Great question, though, man. It, it, is, a, it is a good question. But, uh, you know, if you have kids, give them a book and not an iPad. Yeah. You have to read in front of your kids, too. That's yeah. the only way you get kids are going to read. You it's can't be on your device because they'll be on your device. But I, I do think that that's a question a lot of people are struggling with, especially when it comes to presenting. Amir, you could maybe speak to, like, how many book readings you did and how did you make those sexy? <laughs> Besides just talking just about sex, <laughs> she walks into the room. Matter. So I have a great inner conflict over readings because part of me thinks they're the most expletive boring events on earth. And, and I sympathize with my children because I've dragged them to so many readings that I just say the word reading and they go, oh, and they'll be, they'll be sitting in the back, you know, with a 
with their own book actually reading during a reading to avoid the reading. And um, because readings aren't fun, or at, 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 at the most they're a crapshoot, because a, a writer you may love may be a complete dud in that setting, and a writer that you, you know, may not have ever heard of might be funny and charming, and you just don't know what you're going to get. And especially if you don't have a car or the weather's bad, like, why are you going to chance it on something that's not a guaranteed sexy, fun event? Um, and I don't have the answer, so maybe that's for <laughs> next year's festival. Well, well what about um, giving kids things that they like, that they're interested in, that are culturally, you know, uh, interesting to them, and maybe... Like yeah, diverse, like what yeah, was Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but I'd also say, what about adults? Like, we need to give adults things that they're interested in, too, because I think that we often focus on children, but adults don't read books. The National Endowment for the Arts study, uh, we need more people reading books. Uh, and I think the one way to make like readings and books sexy too is collaboration and we go back full circle like what makes literary city is collaboration and it's the same thing with like reading and in public we need to do we need to do it in public we need to go to Clyde Warren Park and read books and we there have been events like that we need to bring in theater like actors to read books out loud because guess what we have amazing actors in Dallas and they're a part of our literary community and we have great playwrights, and we have, we just need to connect like all the arts. Visual arts is part of the literary community, and we're part of theirs, and so we just need to connect all those dots, and that's when reading, like we'll be able to say, Dallas is a literary city, and reading is sexy in Dallas, right? Yeah, right, right. that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>